Good evening, everyone. This is the stpete.net meetup. Tonight, we will be hosting Scott Hannon, talking about depending on functions instead of interfaces, why and how. Uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll give it a few minutes and let everybody join that's going to join. Um, if you have questions anytime, just feel free to type them in chat and we'll make sure that they get addressed. Um, looks like Clayton needs to adjust the name on We're screen. Up, yeah. yeah, working on it. Working on it. Oh, yeah. How is the audio out there, chat? We, are we doing good? Is it sounding, sounding all right? Loud and clear. All right. Yeah, everybody should be turned all the way up. Uh, Scott, do you have a, what's your uh, Twitter? Do you have a Twitter? Uh, just like my name, Scott Hannon. Don't know if I'm going to be I'm able really to manage it. Be on Twitter like... There we go. There we go. Should be updated now. So oh, yeah. in a few seconds, everybody will see the all updated right. value. Sorry about that. I missed a spot. So chat, who who do we have in chat? Go ahead and sound off and maybe uh, state your name, state your current location, maybe city, town, state, something like that. Who is your daddy and what does he do? No, we'll probably stay away from those. So Martin saying, not me. Martin, we know you're you're in the area. Brian from Deltona, welcome, welcome. Del I'm John from Tampa. Where's Deltona? Mike Murray from San Diego. Aaron from Indiana is Type O blood. Is that Type O negative? Is it, is it negative or positive? Because one's a universal donor and one's a universal universal recipient, right? So it's it's important. Play show, well, howdy. Welcome. Hey, there's a <clears throat> local one, Bradenton. How's it going, Rose? Welcome, welcome. Yeah, we, we do this every month. Um, we've been live streaming for a while. Uh, even back when we were in person, when it was safe to do so, we would uh, attempt the live stream and, and often we're successful, depending on the technical difficulties. Uh, when it's safe to do so, we'll, we'll be in person again and continue the live stream. Um, but uh, with, with the current circumstances and being remote, we're, we're taking every advantage. If we've got someone local that like, like Scott here that wants to speak, then we're, we're deferring to the local folks first. And if we don't have anybody that, that um, is, is willing or, or able to speak remotely uh, locally, then we're reaching out to the broader community. So I know we've got uh, some additional spots open up in the future and, and we've already got some that are spoken for. So if there's any topics or any speakers or any anybody that wants to volunteer themselves or a coworker to, to speak um, virtually, then we'd, we'd love to have you. Just let us know in chat. We'll give it a, a few more minutes. We'll we'll probably start at five past the hour and let everybody join, grab a, a beverage, grab a slice of pizza. Yeah, I don't have any pizza today. Yeah, I had some uh, cheesy poofs earlier, so. I got let's... some, uh, what are they? Spicy sweet chili Doritos. Mm -hmm. And Scott, you said you, you had tea earlier, right? Tea, uh rice cakes um wood chips and dirt tasty <laughs> all right um so any any announcements any anybody doing anything special any upcoming uh, additional online conferences meetups user groups anything that we should be aware of We're, we're approaching times when it's it's a little bit slower in tech, right? It seems like conferences are, are in the spring, or at least were in the spring, uh, and then again in in fall. So 
Um, don't know of any upcoming announcements in, in the .NET realm. I know that we're looking forward to .NET 6 in November. So um, looking for any, any and all announcements for that. Have you heard any updates on uh, Ty or Maui? Uh, I haven't. I saw a blog post update on Maui recently, uh, not on an official channel. So I think it looked like maybe a user going over something. Um, so I'll, I'll look for that again, and maybe we can discuss that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Ignite. Yeah. Ignite Part 2 next month. Excellent. Yeah, I want to say I was at the Microsoft Events page, and I saw that earlier today. Yeah, drop drop a link in chat if if you don't mind. All right, that's uh, five past the hour, so we'll hand it over to to Scott. Uh, Scott Hannon's going to be talking about depending on functions instead of interfaces, why and how. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Scott Hannon. Thank you for uh, being here. I'm just going to briefly mention my background and add uh, some context. I got into writing software about 20 years ago, and after about 10 years, it started making a lot more sense. I learned about writing unit tests and started to read books and blog posts about how to make code more uh, maintainable and readable. And that's when I started to feel like I had some idea what I was doing and the job uh, became a lot more fun. So I don't come from a computer science background and I'm not any sort of uh, rock star uh, developer, if anyone is, definitely not me. So here's what I have learned. Uh, at some point, Maybe our code gets out of control, uh, it gets big and messy to the point where it's difficult to change or test, and it's really hard for new developers to work in. And when that happens, we sometimes wish that we could go back and start all over again. But if we could start over, do we really know why it got the way it was before and what we would do differently? If we don't know what caused something, then we're very likely to do the same thing or something just like it uh, again. And here's what makes that difficult. The things that we should have done differently aren't usually big and easy to spot. There are lots and lots of really tiny decisions. They're so small that when we make them, they don't seem uh, important. And individually they aren't, but the effects are gradual and cumulative. And that makes the causes and effects much harder to see. And if we can't see them, then we repeat them. So what I'm speaking about tonight is just one of those many, many little things. It's not some big game changer. It's really small and simple. In addition to just that, I'll also talk a little bit about dependency injection, some other principles, and how some of the issues we find in our code can be traced back to these smaller decisions. Uh, and that way, even if I get to the part about depending on functions and you say, well, that's awful. I don't ever want to do that. Well, then maybe at least it'll give you a, a different idea to work with. Uh, so as I get into this, uh, let me know uh, in, in the chat uh, if I mention any unfamiliar concepts or use words that need more explanation. And if I can, uh, I'll elaborate. Uh, and if I can't, then maybe I can provide some reference information at the end. Uh, so occasionally I'll stop and ask uh, for that. And if I start talking really fast, I'm not trying to unleash a torrent of information. It just means that in the back of my mind, I'm afraid of boring you to death. Uh, so if I start doing that, then maybe someone can tell me to slow down, unless I am boring you to death, and then you can tell me to go faster. So to start with, let me clarify what I mean when I say depending on an interface or a class or a function or delegate. When we say that a class depends on something, we're saying the class uses that something. It needs something that will do this other thing for it. So in practical terms, I'm talking about dependency injection. So here's a really simple example of dependency injection. And does that show up on the, uh, on the screen? Okay, good. <clears throat> so uh, I cut a lot of corners here with this, uh, with this example because uh, I didn't want to waste too much time on stuff that wasn't uh, relevant. Uh, but in this class, uh, we, in this example, we have a class which is an order validator. And its job is to make sure that the order is valid. And it's going to put uh, all of the errors that it finds into this validation result and then return it. <clears throat> in order to do those things, <coughs> excuse me, in order to do those things, this class depends on these two interfaces. One of them will validate the address and the other will validate the contents of the order. Those two interfaces are dependencies 
for this class. We could just take all the code for those two steps and put all of that right into this class, but then the class would start to get really big and complicated. It would be hard to read and hard to test. So the job of this class is just to gather the results from these other validations. Uh, so those steps, also the validation, might get complicated on their own, but we can test those separately. That way uh, each class is small and doesn't do too much and it's easy to test. Can you zoom in just a little bit, please? I'm sorry? Could you zoom in just a little oh, bit? Yep. Let's try. Is that good or bigger? Do you want bigger or is that good? Okay. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Okay, well, let's make it a little bit bigger there. Okay. <clears throat> so dependency injection roughly means that instead of this class, order validator, creating the dependencies that it needs, it receives them through its constructor. It only knows about the interfaces. It doesn't know anything about the classes that implement these interfaces. Uh, and also these dependencies are constructor arguments which means that it's impossible to create an instance of this class without also providing the dependencies that it needs. <clears throat> and this enables us to write unit tests for order validator using mocked versions of those interfaces. So here's a, an example of a, uh, of a unit test. Um, in this case, I wanna make sure that whatever errors the address validator returns, they get added to the validation result. So what I'm going to do is create a mocked implementation of uh, the address validator interface using a, a library called mock, uh, M-O-Q, which is uh, very common uh, for, for doing that. Uh, and that mocked implementation, regardless of what address I tell it to validate, it is always going to return these two errors. And now I can create an instance of order validator, and I'm going to pass in those mocked interfaces to, the, uh, to its constructor, uh, and when I validate the order, it doesn't matter what address I pass in, it should always uh, add these two errors uh, to, to that message. And so I can test that this class is behaving as I expect it to without worrying about the logic of how the actual validation uh, takes place. If I couldn't do that, if I couldn't mock, then I'd have to set up the whole thing from end to end with real data and real addresses just to test the logic in this one class. And what if that validation calls another API or a database? I'd need that too. But this way, I don't care about how the address validator works. I'll test that elsewhere. I'm just testing that the order validator interacts with the address validator the way I expect it to. Uh, so that's roughly, that, that's what a dependency is, what we're talking about depending on something. Uh, let's say five years ago, not as many developers knew about dependency injection, but now it's a lot more familiar as we use uh, a service collection. Uh, for example, here's, uh, here's what that looks like. Uh, we use a service collection and we'll register these dependencies with that collection. We'll say, when I ask for I address validator, give me an instance of address validator. When I ask for this interface, give me this uh, implementation. Uh, so that's a very uh, brief interview, uh, overview of dependency injection. Uh, so let me go ahead and pause there for a moment. Anything to go over? Probably not, okay. Um, so this example showed a class that depends on interfaces. What I'm getting to in a roundabout way uh, is how to depend on delegates or functions instead and why that is helpful. So before getting into how a class might depend on a delegate, I'll illustrate some of the issues that I'm trying to avoid. Have you ever seen an interface that looks like this? This one has maybe 19 or 20 uh, methods. Um, I've seen this over and over. I work with more projects that have interfaces like this than those that don't have them. So I know it, it can't just be me. And this is just the interface. Imagine what the class must look like that implements this. It might be 1500 lines long or worse. That class might have a constructor with 10 or 15 more different dependencies injected into it. 
So when I see that, that makes me very sad, and it probably makes you sad too when you when you see this in code. But how does this happen? No one sets out to create this. One issue, one reason why this happens uh, is the name. I sales order service. It's very vague. So because it's vague, anytime we need some new method related to sales orders, it could be any one of these things, we're likely to just throw it into this giant interface and the giant class. It's already got 20, what's one more? Now, what if instead we had an interface that looked like this or this? In this case, the name of the interface describes specifically what it does. The names might not be perfect because naming things is hard, but at least they're specific. Uh, so that name alone is going to discourage adding other random methods into this interface. Uh, this is small, the implementation will be small, and so hopefully we'll have a little bit of logic in this class and it'll be easy to write some small, simple tests. Uh, so that's a, a benefit to uh, avoiding classes with names like manager or, or service. It's not just that the name itself is vague, but the name includes too much and it doesn't exclude anything. And so stuff gets piled into it and it just grows out of control. So why is this big interface harmful? Well, for a few reasons. Uh, one, the implementation of this interface is going to be a huge class and that's harder to work with. We have more defects, everything is slower. It's also very unlikely that any one class is going to use all of the methods in this interface. If one class does call all of these methods, well then that's a whole bigger problem because now we have two really big classes. But instead we're going to have one class that calls one or two of these methods uh, and then another class that calls another method and so on. And when that happens, that means that we're violating the interface segregation principle. Um, each consumer uses a few methods, but the dependency is on the whole interface, which includes the methods they don't use. So why do we not want to violate the interface segregation principle? I, I think it's maybe one of the most poorly illustrated uh, ones in, in many of the, the articles I, I, that I, I look at. Well, when we have a big interface and different consumers use different parts of it, that unnecessarily inflates the number of classes, which are the consumers of this one large interface. There should be more interfaces, each with fewer consumers. The more consumers there are, the more likely we are to modify the interface and its implementations to meet the needs of just one consumer. And then we do it again, changing the whole thing for another consumer. But when we do that, we're modifying an interface and implementation that's used by all the consumers, which means we risk affecting all of them. So by having so many classes depend on that interface, we're simultaneously increasing the likelihood that we'll change it and increasing the number of classes that might be affected by that change. No, so that's the interface segregation principle, and we're almost uh, certainly violating it if we have an interface that looks anything like this. Now, when this happens, we survive. We manage to make those changes without breaking stuff, usually, but it's harder. We have to be a lot more careful. It doesn't kill us. It doesn't make us stronger either. It just slows us down, and it's riskier. So many times we do introduce a defect. Here's another problem that this large interface uh, creates. And again, it's none of these are big. They're, they're, they're all just a large number of small problems. Suppose we have another class that depends on this interface. It depends on iSales, uh, on an iSales order service, uh, like this one. Uh, this class depends on a number of interfaces, and one of them is sales order service. Well, from looking at this, how easy or hard is it to tell why it depends on that interface? If this interface was small and specific, we would be able to tell just by looking at it. But we know this interface is huge. So this class could be calling any, any number of methods. We can't, we can't really tell what it's doing unless we read through the class or find all the usages uh, of, that, uh, of that variable, of that field. Um, and we need to know which methods it uses in order to write a unit test uh, for this uh, class. And again, it's nothing that we can't figure out. 
but it slows us down. Uh, it slows down the next person who doesn't know this code at all. And this is what hits them when they look at it. And they have to deal with the cognitive load of looking at that um, big giant interface. Uh, so that's something uh, we can split up, but that's, uh, that's another uh, subject. Uh, so I'll pause again. Any, uh, any questions to answer? I don't see anything in the chat, so I guess that's, that's a no. So one thing that helps us, one of our goals is then to create smaller or more specific interfaces and abstractions. One thing that's going to help us to do that is to create them from the perspective of the classes that depend on them. What does that mean? Well, suppose I'm writing this class, um, which handles the command to place a new order. And as I'm writing it, or maybe later while I'm changing it, I realize that I'm going to need to validate the order. And I know that it's going to be complicated enough that I'm going to want to test that validation separately from the rest of this class. So I'm going to want to inject something into this class that validates the order. So what do I do? I could say, well, I already have a service, iSales order service, and it has a bunch of order related stuff. That's where I put my order methods. So I'll stick order validation in there and I'll depend uh, on, uh, on that. So we could just do, this is why I, I limit the amount of typing I do during this because I can't type while I'm being watched. So we could just uh, inject this into our class. Uh, but that decision right there is how these things grow. Now we've just added something else into this uh, sales order service interface, and it's one step towards getting bigger. So here's, uh, here's a better approach. Suppose, uh, unless I already have something specific just for this, I define an interface that well, that's going to do exactly what I need. So so now this very specifically represents that uh, that that abstraction it represents what I need Wow that's bad I'm so sorry and well we'll call that address validator whatever it doesn't matter I'm gonna inject that uh, so this is not some big all-purpose interface. It was defined from the perspective of this consumer to meet the need of this consumer. And that's why it's going to be small and it's likely to stay small. Uh, and it's nice that I can finish uh, working on uh, I can finish working on this class here that I've already started, and then I can come back later to implementing this interface. Or if we're collaborating uh, and someone else wants to help, uh, then uh, then I can ask them, hey, can you implement this interface for me while I'm still writing this class? So when we do that, the result of this is going to be small interfaces with specific names, and the implementations are small classes. And there is a balance to this and a trade-off. Many people don't like that. Uh, and we can go to an extreme where we have maybe a ton of little tiny classes that don't do much and lots of interfaces. I've heard that called uh, test-induced damage, or many people don't like that. I don't claim to know what the perfect balance is. But in most code that I've worked in, the pendulum has swung toward everything being way too large. Uh, and that's why I'm going to lean heavily towards small and specific, because that leaves some room uh, so that even if there's some entropy and they start growing a little bit, they won't get too big because they started off small. So I can't control the future, but I want to set it on the right path. Uh, and uh, over time, maybe I'll get better at designing so that I don't even have to go as small and granular. It's just what I found, uh, what I found works well. So even still, writing small interfaces like this bugs me just a little bit. And here's why. Uh, we sometimes get these interfaces with one method, 
uh, and the method name describes what I want to do, but the, the name of the interface is a little bit awkward and redundant because both of these are really saying essentially uh, the same thing. And I'm okay with that, that's not bad, but there is a way to make it better. And this is where delegates come in. Uh, we can use a delegate as an abstraction for a single method. So instead of uh, creating an interface and having a method, we can just create a, I should have practiced typing that a hundred times. We can create delegates representing just the methods themselves. And we can use these without actually having uh, an interface. So now these interfaces become uh, just these delegates. So uh, just as an interface can represent a class that implements it, a delegate represents a method signature, which a method can implement. So let's see what this looks like then uh, in a class. What does it look like if a class depends on delegates? Well, here's a simple class with two dependencies injected into it. And this is uh, heavily oversimplified. It's not really code that makes uh, any sense. But again, just to demonstrate the dependency injection. So what would this look like if we wrote this class so that it depended on delegates? Well, it's going to look uh, almost the same. Have I declared those yet? No. So. Public, it won't compile. So now I've got these public. I really do do this all day long. Um, so now we can replace these with our delegates. Everything okay there? And now, instead of invoking this on a class, I'm just this verify user. Wow, this has got to be the a real, that's a real low light there. Sorry about that. So that's what it looks like. So now I'm injecting these delegates instead of interfaces. And when I get to the point where I need them, I'm just invoking uh, those methods within my class. Uh, now, in this case, I'm using delegates for this. This could also just be, um, uh, these, are, these could be functs or actions. And many times that's good enough. But a delegate allows us to put a name on it that specifies uh, what it's for. So that's the change. Uh, depending on delegates instead uh, of uh, of interfaces. Now, hopefully, I set the expectation that this wasn't going to be the most revolutionary uh, change ever, uh, and it's not. But we do get some benefits uh, out of it. Uh, and let's consider what a few of those are. First, when we look at the dependencies for this class. Um, it, it's very easy to see, if I, if I name them correctly, it's very easy to see what they're used for. One is called verify user permissions, one is called update foo. They actually say uh, what, uh, what they're for. Uh, now, previously I had uh, foo service. Well, from that you couldn't really tell by looking at this. But this dependency can only do one thing, uh, and it says what that is. Uh, 
We can also use the number of dependencies uh, to get an idea of how many things this class does. Um, what if we had the iFoo service interface as before, and we wanted to modify this class so that it does more things, like check the foo status or send a foo notification? The tendency we have is to say, well, I already depend on foo service, and this is a foo-related method, so I'll just add those new methods into foo service. And if we do that, then two things are happening. One, foo service is getting bigger. It's on its way to becoming that 3,000 line class. But it's also harder to tell how much this class does by looking at the number of dependencies. I've just added uh, two more behaviors to it, but the number of dependencies hasn't increased. It still has the same uh, two it had before. So it's as if I'm hiding those new behaviors inside existing dependencies. If our dependencies are delegates, then that's impossible. Uh, we use uh, each delegate for one thing, and if we want more dependencies, then we have to explicitly add them. So that really matters. Being able to accurately see the number of dependencies is important so that we can see if a class is doing too many things. How many dependencies should a class have? Well, that's ultimately up to you. I like to use some magic numbers for how many dependencies uh, I can have in a class. And I call them magic numbers just because they're made up. They're arbitrary numbers. Uh, so when I'm writing a new class, I try to limit it to three dependencies. Uh, and as it grows, I'll allow four or, or maybe five, but I'll try to keep it down to four because that means the class probably isn't doing too many things. And if I have to modify the code and have to add a sixth dependency, then I'm going to refactor it so that I'm back down to three or four. So what is the point of making up those arbitrary magic numbers? It's not like they're perfect, like every class needs the same number of dependencies. But what they do is they serve as limits. If I don't let a class have six dependencies, then it will never ever have 20. So I know what it's like to work with giant classes that have 10, 15, or 20 dependencies, and I never want to do that again. And so I set that arbitrary limit to make sure that never happens. And being able to see them each explicitly that way uh, gives me that ability to count them. Just we've diverging a, a little bit. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions in chat. Uh, so Freakin Ward asks, does this change how the implementations are injected? Um, I'm glad you asked. That's coming up. Okay. And then the second question, uh, curious to know if we register them as scope services, scope service to use throughout the application. Good question. That's also coming. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, so, just diverging a little bit, I, you know, we mentioned having too many dependencies, and why, why do we want to prevent that from happening? Well, what happens when a class depends on 15 interfaces? Well, here's an example of a class that has lots of dependencies. Maybe you've had a class uh, like this. And then here is what the test class for that is going to look like. I call this the wall of mock because we have all these, uh, all these mocks uh, declared, then we instantiate them, uh, then we pass them to the constructor, then we're gonna have uh, probably another page of code that sets up behaviors for these mocks. And by the time we get to the actual tests, uh, we're setting up a, a few more mock behaviors and it's hard to even tell which method we're testing uses which one of these mocks. So that just gets uh, out of control and it's very hard to understand. And this test class, can also be 2,000 lines long. So that's ultimately why it's important to be, be able to be able to count the number of dependencies so that something like this doesn't happen, as well as the class not having too many responsibilities. Uh, so that, that's why I have some magic numbers. I also limit methods to 15 lines of code for the same reason. It's not that 15 is some scientifically perfect number, but if I pick a limit, then it's impossible to write the big giant method with 100 lines. Another nice thing about delegates and functions is that they are extremely easy to mock when writing unit tests. So uh, here's an example of, uh, of writing a mock, again, with the, uh, the MOQ mock uh, library. Suppose I have, uh, I have an interface. Here's my interface. Here's my interface. 
Um, and I want to mock this interface so that when it gets invoked, I capture this, this input and I assign it to a variable so that I can look and see, well, what did I pass to that mock? In order to do that, I would write something like this. You define the mock and then you set it up and you tell it that when this gets invoked, assign what was passed to it to this variable. And this isn't horrible, but it is noisy and verbose. And uh, it probably took me 20 times before I could remember the syntax for doing this. If we want to mock a delegate, we don't need any framework at all. So just to give an example, so that was the, uh, here's the interface, here's the same thing as a delegate. Now, what if we want to mock a delegate and we want to do the exact same thing? We want the mock to capture the input to a variable and then return something. Well, in that case, we could declare an anonymous method. And we're going to say our captured input equals the input. And that's it. So it's not massive, it's not night and day, but it's definitely easier. This is this is uh, smaller, more to the point, and easier to read than this, and doesn't require any uh, unusual syntax. Uh, so I, I like using mock, and I use it all the time, but I don't like writing lots and lots of this. Now, what if we have a more complicated scenario uh, when we have to create our mock? What if we need to have the mock return one value the first time it's called, then another value the second time it's called, uh, and then a different value the third time. Well, if we're using, uh, where is it? If we're using an interface, we would do something like this. We would say mock setup sequence, and we would say that sequence, the first time it's gonna return one, then it's gonna return two, it's gonna throw an exception, fourth time it'll return four. Well, what if we want to do the same thing with uh, a delegate? Well, I, I wrote something by hand and it worked, but the syntax was clunky and it's hard to read. However, it turns out that if we need to, we can also use this mock library with delegates, uh, which means that in this case, where the library makes it easier than writing my own code, then I can just go ahead and use uh, the uh, exact same thing. So uh, we can use an anonymous function when that's easier, which it usually is. Uh, but we can still use a library like mock where that's easier. Uh, and the same goes for classes. Sometimes I use mock, but the moment it gets hard to read, then I might just take a moment and write a simple class that implements my interface. And that's easy if the interface is small, and then it makes the test a lot easier to understand with that, with it, then all the, the mock setup. It might take an extra minute, but it saves loads of time in the long run. Uh, and, uh, if you remind me later, I can show you an example of that that maybe a lot of us uh, can use. So that shows us what it looks like when we write a class that depends on delegates or functions and how that affects our tests. So now uh, we get to the, the part that uh, a few, uh, few have asked about, which is how we register those with a dependency injection uh, container. Uh, so just in case that, that term is I don't know if we still say that, but when I talk about registering a, a dependency or registering an implementation, that's when we set up our dependency injection container, like our service collection, so that it knows. When I ask for this interface, give me this class. Uh, when I ask for this delegate, give me this method. So how do we register a delegate? Well, that depends. If the implementation is a static method, then it's really, really easy. Uh, so static methods are a good use case for, for delegates. Uh, for the longest time, I thought that depending on static methods was bad because it made code harder to test. But that's not a problem if we're not depending directly on the static method. We're depending on an abstraction, the delegate. So we can mock the delegate, but the runtime implementation is the static method. So registering this with the, uh, with the container 
I have this delegate and I want the implementation to be this static method. So I'm going to register it exactly the same way I would with an interface. I'm going to register this as a singleton because there's really no reason to resolve this over and over again. It's always going to be the same static method. And I'm going to tell it that for this type, the delegate type is palindrome checker. I want it to use this instance, which is pointing to this static method. So for this delegate, I want to use this implementation. And that's it. So now if I build a service provider and I resolve this delegate injecting into a class, it's going to return this method. And if we're uh, reading this code and we see this delegate injected and we want to know what the implementation is, or if there are multiple implementations that we use, then we can just look in our code for usages of this delegate. We can say find usages and it's gonna point us right here. And our dependency setup is gonna tell us when we require this, we're using this implementation. So that means that we don't have to create an interface. So using a static method is the most obvious use case. Um, it works well for when calling a static method directly would make the class untestable. To show another example of that, here, uh, here's a class that reads from a file. Uh, and it depends on this static read all bytes method. That means the only way that we can test this class is by actually having a file in the file system that we can read and passing it this path. <clears throat> but that's not ideal. We don't want to have to create files and read from the file system. <clears throat> so what we can do then instead is we can inject a delegate. So we can create uh, a So we create a delegate. Now we can inject it into this class. And we can inject that. And now uh, in the startup where I register my dependencies, I can say that The implementation of read all bytes from file is going to be file read all bytes. And so now I, I can write a test for this class that's going to mock that, and I can have that test return any uh, bytes that I want. So I've eliminated that uh, hard, untestable dependency on the file system. So let's look at one more scenario, and this is. Uh, this is the last one. I guess I, I did talk fast. What if we want to inject a delegate and depend on it, but the implementation is not a static method? It's an instance method. Uh, that is, we want to create an instance of a class and then use a method on that class instance as our delegate. So let's use, uh, let's look at an example of this. So here's a delegate, validate order. And I want the implementation of that delegate to be this method on this order validation facade class, which is none of this is static. Why, why, my, why might we want to do that? Because this class has dependencies of its own, and those dependencies might have dependencies and so on. So we need this class to be resolved from our container, from our service provider. So how do we do that? Well, we could just not depend on a delegate. We could stick an interface on this class uh, and uh, inject that instead. But we should be able to do that with a delegate. What if our code already depended on this delegate and we don't want to go back and change that code just because now the implementation is going to be an instance class? So how do we register that with our service collection so that we supply a delegate and what we get is this method off of an instance of this class? Well, first, let's look at the uh, the ugly way of doing it. 
Uh, so first, we're going to register our order validation facade so that it knows how to resolve that. Uh, and the question was raised, well, raised, what about the scope? Well, the answer is that uh, the scope is whatever you want the scope of this class to be. So this class could be scoped, transient, singleton, whatever. Uh, then we're going to register the delegate using a factory method. And that factory method is going to do two things. It's first going to resolve an instance of an order validation facade from the container. And then it's going to return the validate order uh, of, that, uh, of that class. This one can be transient because it really doesn't matter. This is the class that's, that's getting uh, resolved or, or not resolved uh, each time. Uh, so as long as this is transient, this can be singleton, whatever it might be, and it'll really obey the rules of however this one is declared. <clears throat> so we can do this. This is a little bit much to type just to register something that's a lot more verbose than registering an interface. Uh, so we can make this better because if we do this over and over again, it's really going to be the exact same code every time. Just the types are different. Validate order is different. Uh, and uh, and the type that we resolve it from are different. So we can make this a little bit more, more concise by using an extension method. Uh, so this is going to basically do that work for us. We have this extension. We're going to pass it in our service collection. We have a generic argument telling us what is the type that we're going to resolve, what is the instance type, and what is the delegate that we want to resolve from that instance. And then we're finally going to provide a function that is going to get the delegate from the instance. And we're going to register that factory method so that it's going to resolve that instance just like before. And now it's going to pass that instance to our function to get the delegate. And that confused me just saying it. I, I think I just put myself to sleep. Uh, it makes a lot more sense if we, uh, if we see the actual usage of that. So now we can say service collection, register delegate from service, and we're gonna specify the type of the service, which is order, order validation facade and the type of the delegate, which is validate order. And the argument we're going to pass is just going to be this anonymous function that gets the delegate from the instance. So now instead of all of this, we have something closer to one line, and that's that's more uh, that's more bearable. Now, do we want to do all of this? Well, th that's obviously a very personal choice. It depends on what our team is okay with. Uh, but what it means is that if we like the way that our, our code looks and feels when it depends on delegates instead of interfaces, and we like how easy they are to mock, then we're not limited to only using static methods. Anything that we can do with interfaces and instance classes, we can also do with delegates. So uh, just to wrap this up, I, I haven't learned uh, F Sharp, and I have no idea how to compose an application entirely out of functions. That's uh, on my to-do list after I learned TDD and, and Blazor. But this might be a step in that direction and help us to get the feel for composing behaviors out of functions and not just classes. That's also something that we do a lot of in JavaScript. And I'm not recommending this as a pattern for its own sake, like something that people should rush out and do, like everyone started creating uh, singletons uh, 15 years ago, because that's pretty much always harmful. But if we're already employing dependency injection with interfaces, but we find that those interfaces and their implementations are growing large and out of control, then starting with delegates may be a way to install guardrails against that growth. They won't prevent those giant classes and hard to read tests, but they steer us away from that. 
They lead us to define narrow, specific abstractions with smaller implementations that are easier to read, easier to test, and more likely to stay that way. And that is the end. I tried to make a slide that said the end, but it didn't come out right, so I scrapped it. How do you usually go about arranging your, your code and, and um, separating out files and, and interfaces and classes, implementations, delegates, so on and so forth? Do you find that you you handle them differently or or uh, does that like in, in, in different folders, in different projects, different classes? So ideally what I want, uh, and this is something that it's, well, almost a whole other fun subject, but the uh, the going back to uh, let me look at uh, let me look, look at this example. This class depends on these two abstractions. So you could say this class owns these abstractions. Um, these should be near order validator. They should be in the, like ideally in, in the same project. Um, I've never actually gotten the chance to really explore doing it the way I, I would like to, well, which is uh, basically to, to plug in NDepend, uh, which is a static code analyzer, which is really good about that. Uh, and, uh, and letting that kind of point out to me when I, it, it, it'll give you, it gives you some guidance on that. I tend to come along once all that's done and I really don't have any choice about where I, where I put that stuff. But the short version is that, uh, this is higher level code and it depends on these abstractions. So I don't want these abstractions to come from some other project or some other assembly. <clears throat> I want the, the domain or the higher level code that depends on these interfaces to also be where they're declared. Uh, then the implementation of them could be in that same assembly um, or it could be in some other assembly that contains the implementation deals like, like a database or, or uh, APIs and so forth. Did that make any sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay, good. And chat, uh, chat. feel free to, to chime in with any questions you, you might have. I'm going to continue to ask questions that I think others might have, uh, whether they're in chat now or uh, watching the video later on Twitch or in the backup on YouTube. Um, so what about your, your delegates? Do you, where do you typically group them if you're, uh, if you're depending on your delegates instead of the interfaces and, and so forth? Uh, I really declare them uh, th the same way, except I'm likely just to, to put them, uh, reasonably likely to put them in one file. I, I can't see having, um, uh, like it, we tend to put different interfaces in different files, uh, but with, with delegates, that's that's less practical. Uh, so, uh, you know, to, to again, have them have them in one file that's, that's there, uh, close to where they're being, uh, close to where they're being used, which again goes back to that idea that the delegate uh, or interface, whichever it is, was declared specifically for this, uh, this consumer or other consumers within that, uh, within that code. And that's why I don't want to import an abstraction or a delegate from someplace else. Like sometimes we'll have a separate API client uh, project out there or a repo library out there and that library will contain interfaces and then we import those interfaces back into our code but that's that's kind of backwards that means that our our higher level code like this is depending on the code in those details instead it should it should define its own abstractions and then then another library can supply the implementation of those abstractions I have a blog post about that that says it a whole lot better. And yeah, we'll um, we'll drop your URL in chat here. Uh, so we've got what is a disadvantage to using delegates over interfaces? A disadvantage, I'd say probably the the number one. Uh, 
in my experience, I mean, someone else might have some other feedback, but uh, the lack of familiarity, um, it is difficult and maybe even undesirable to, impl- to introduce something new or different into existing code. So I, I might start working on a project and I find this to be helpful, but I, if they're already doing everything a certain way, uh, de- depending on, on how flexible they are, I, I might just not feel like I can introduce um, something different. Uh, maybe another disadvantage is the, the Visual Studio support is not quite as great uh, in the sense that uh, I can right click on uh, an interface and say, go to the implementation. Um, it's not quite that clear with a, uh, with a delegate. I can't right click on the delegate and say, go to an implementation of that delegate. Um, I think ReSharper uh, adds something a little bit like that. Um, for example, I can right click on this uh, delegate and find usages advanced and find delegate targets. And so it's going to find for me, um, it's going to find anything that implements that, uh, that method signature. But generally the way I would actually find it would just be again, like I showed by, by right clicking on that and, uh, and saying find usages and that's going to navigate me back to wherever my dependency registration is. Well, to be fair, delegates have really been only only in the language for 15 years or so. So, yeah. I mean, they've 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 got more important things to tackle, I guess. Uh, you know, so- on a static class, you can also there is one thing you can do on a static class, which uh, is it's a little bit it's a little bit clunky, and I guess you could do this on a. See, uh, so where's my? Uh, I have an example of this. Is you could. Uh, you could say public static the the effects of, of typing when someone is watching you are apparently just multiplied a gazillion times uh, equals Okay, I've blown that syntax really bad. It's it's easier if I just, it it guides me better if I start up from scratch. That's what I'm looking for. So you can do that, and now the uh, the this is explicitly declared as an implementation of this uh, delegate, and you could do something like that on a on an instance uh, on an instance class too. You could have a a method, uh, a separate delegate method, because this has to be static. So that, that's kind of clunky. Um, so generally, no, I wouldn't do that. Okay. And Hudson asks, uh, when you have several delegates that need to be injected, at what point do you look to go to an interface, or are you really trying to break the interfaces into smaller chunks? Um, So if there is an interface where it it seems cohesive, where things things belong uh, together, uh, then then I I wouldn't necessarily see a need to uh, to go breaking it up. In, in fact, I, I mean, if I've already started with interfaces, I'm pretty much never going to break that up. Um, but it seems more common than not that I, I end up having different interfaces with different methods, uh, in which case the delegate makes makes more sense. Uh, so it really just just depends. I mean, the idea is that a, that again, the uh, if if one class can depend on all the methods of that interface and they're all related, 
Uh, and if it doesn't mean that some other consumer of that interface is going to be using parts of that interface and it's going to start becoming that big interface, then I won't do it. But if it seems cohesive, which is, I guess, a, a vague term, but uh, for example, the implementation of that interface, do all the methods use the same private variables or do they use different ones? In which case the implementation is really multiple classes kind of glued together in one. I don't feel like anything I said just made any sense. M made sense to me. Um, okay, good. Yeah, I think in, in VJ building on Hudson's question, uh, wondering maybe when we reach a certain number, do we make an interface instead? So I guess the, the reverse, if you were to start with delegates and then seeing that you're just creating multiple delegates, would it make sense then to refactor and group them into an interface, into a, a class with implementations of all of those dependencies? I would say it's possible, but it really depends on whether or not they are related enough that the implementations belong naturally in one class together. So the goal would never be to say, well, I've got multiple methods. How can I get them into the same place? The class itself that implements that interface should uh, adhere to the, for example, the, the single uh, responsibility uh, principle. Uh, so it, it would just, it would have to be a case where, where it made sense uh, for those, uh, those things uh, to be together. Generally, I mean, one of the, de the benefits of depending on abstractions is that you don't have to go back and refactor uh, that sort of thing. Like, like if something depends on an interface or depends on a delegate, I shouldn't have to go back and refactor it because I've changed some detail like that. Uh, if it was a good abstraction, it shouldn't need, need to change based on the implementation. And Basebling says, uh, similar to the functional programming subject, it seems like using delegates might promote stateless logic. Yes. That is correct. Uh, and it, I mean, in, in cases where uh, I, I've see, I, I haven't really gotten too deeply into, into functional, the real functional programming, F sharp and so forth. But for example, if you have a, a class that has a dependency injected into it, uh, and you call a private method, you could refactor that private method into a static method uh, just by passing that dependency explicitly to it as an argument. And so now it's just a, it's, it's a pure method that, uh, that doesn't actually depend on having an instance uh, field for that dependency. But generally, just, uh, Anything static or stateless, and that, that was one of the other reasons why I saw value in this, is because all my classes, they tended to be pretty much stateless anyway. Um, so it just seemed like a logical evolution from that from there to, to try using uh, more uh, more static methods. Okay. It looks like we've got Deflux asking for for each loops. Um, so Deflux, we're we're gonna stick to the subject tonight for Scott Han Scott Hannon's. Uh, presentation on depending on functions instead of interfaces. If you'd like to join us tomorrow night, Clayton and I will be back with John Ash on the Six Figure Dev channel doing some live coding, live coding at 8 p.m. Eastern, and we'd be happy to uh, to chat with you there and, and answer any questions you might have. Um, with that chat, if there are more questions, please shoot them into the chat, and we will get them addressed. Clayton, did you anything? Stick out at you. Um, I, I've seen, I saw a, a presentation in Orlando a couple of years ago um, that had kind of a similar approach, um, you, depending on delegates, by the person uh, that wrote the Fluent Assertions Library. Let me see if I can find that. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I was thinking about while watching your presentation. Um, really enjoyed both approaches and, and both presentations, so I appreciate it. Um, uh, Dennis Duman, I believe. Um, so he, he also had a, a similar... It, 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 it reminded me um, the, of kind of a similar approach here. So it's uh, certainly not out of the realm of, of 
everyday coding. Um, so I think there's opportunities that to utilize this type of, of uh, coding style and, and syntax and, and implementations. Do you have this in, in a GitHub repo or, or code available for those following along or? Uh, there is no, I mean, well, I actually, technically, yes, I did put this into a GitHub repo so I'd be able to undo all the typing that I did, but it's, I don't know how useful it is. Uh, as far as like uh, looking at this, um, like this extension, uh, if you if you Google how to register a delegate with service collection, uh, you will get a Stack Overflow answer with this extension in it. I don't know if that helps. Okay. I, I yeah, kind of store perfect. my own documentation in Stack Overflow. <laughs> nice. Yeah, it was uh, GitHub stalking you during your presentation as well. So you yeah, got the, your, yeah, there's uh, not your much. repositories up here. I, I've never been at, I haven't really got in the habit of putting stuff out there. Well, well, we'll put a link in chat in case uh, in case we can encourage you to to put something out there and um, but uh, it, with that any any other questions comments concerns we've got a, a thanks to all to you all for your time so yeah great great presentation really appreciate it um, we're, we're kind of coming up on the end of time uh, wanted to see if there are any additional questions. Yeah, Freakin' Ward said, good conversations tonight. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we will be back second Tuesday of the month, every month, virtually until it is safe to be in person. And even when we go back to in-person meetings, we will continue to do the live stream of the events on the second Tuesday of the month. Um, as always, we're, we're looking for additional speakers, ad additional topics. If there's anything you or any of your coworkers might be interested in, if you want to volunteer yourself or others, then we would certainly love to have you. Uh, we have some presentations penciled in in the future and, and trying to get more. So uh, we will give preference to those locally or those in chat. If you're willing to, to volunteer tonight, we'll go ahead and get you on the schedule. Um, with that, Clayton and I will be back with John Ash tomorrow night at on the Six Figure Dev channel, link in chat, uh, live coding and working on some Kubernetes and K9s stuff with the Speaker Meet project. And then uh, next Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern on the Six, Six Figure Dev channel for the live recording of the podcast. Uh, so with that, Scott, do you have any final words for us? Uh no, thank you for uh, for uh, listening. All right. Uh, if there are no additional questions, then we will look to see who is out there. Maybe raid our friends over at TBD Gamer. And we will say good night, everyone. Thanks for attending. We will see you next month.